Now I would like to introduce you to today's presenter from Vertex, Peter Borhoff. Enjoy the session. Thanks, Libby, and um, welcome and probably for most of you, good morning um, to this session about what's going on in VAT globally. Um, I will first discuss with you some of the session objectives. The slides are, at least for me, fortunately, they're moving. Um, in this session, I will list the drivers of um, a, a number of global VAT changes. It's too much to cover them all, but um, there are a couple of drivers that I will uh, discuss. We'll also discuss a, global, a couple of global VAT trends and um, also assess how they possibly can impact uh, your business or your, um, let's say, non-US based uh, business. I've extended the agenda a little bit beyond uh, VAT um, because there are also some other quite relevant uh, topics that are not covered in, in any of the other sessions. So we'll start with the global view on, on VAT. Then I will discuss with you um, the impact of, of Brexit that has appeared and also the more or less the current status. Then we will dive briefly into e-compliance and, and digital tax collection. I will take a few snippets on, on e-commerce. And last but definitely not least, I would like to highlight um, some of the green tax developments um, in Europe and, and globally. But before doing this all, let me first um, introduce myself. Um, I'm Peter Burov. I'm the Fed Director in the Chief Tef Tax Office of Vertex, um, based in the Netherlands, uh, nearby Amsterdam. And in my role, I follow global uh, tax trends with a focus specifically on indirect tax, but also on some other taxes um, in order to assess the relevance of these for um, our product and service offerings, um, our, our future developments, but also the impact uh, to our customers. So it's quite a wide uh, scope. So I would suggest to first um, discuss the global view on VAT. And to, to kick this off, um, I would like to start with um, a, a relevant change in France. Um, and it has to do with the import VAT collection. And um, the reform of the import VAT collection will actually um, be effective as of the 1st of January. 2022 and I will I will explain to you what will happen um, under the current rules import VAT is collected by the customs authorities so usually upon entering goods into uh, the French or the EU territory and this is in line with let's say common practice in in most countries around the globe under this process, there is no requirement for the importer to register for, uh, for VAT. So you just import the goods, you pay the VAT to customs. Usually that's done by, uh, by a logistics service provider and no requirement to, to perform any VAT uh, formalities. And if you as the importer are also um, paying actually the import VAT, then the import VAT is recoverable through a refund application. And that this refund application is different for non-EU um, versus EU um, uh, yeah, businesses. But there is just, just a generic refund application. And what will change after the 1st of January 2022 is that um, the import VAT will no longer be collected by the customs authorities, but it will be collected by the tax authorities. And in France, there is a clean, clean split between these two, um, let's say, taxation authorities. So this is quite, um, uh, quite a significant change. Um, so what then also will happen 
is that because the tax authorities are collecting, the importer, the importer um, will have to register for VAT in France. So that's a mandatory VAT registration because you have to self-assess the VAT that is due on the import in your French VAT return. And um, that as a consequence of that, foreign, com foreign companies that are currently not registered um, in, in France, but are involved in importation, they will have to take the necessary steps to register for VAT in France and report the French import VAT on your periodic VAT returns. The consequence is also that the import VAT is not no longer recoverable through a refund application, but it can be recovered through that same periodic VAT return. So you will report import VAT due and recoverable import VAT. So this is quite um, uh, quite a significant step, uh, change um, with respect to the import VAT regulations. In addition to this, the French legislation has also been adjusted um, when they implemented the the e-commerce, the EU e-commerce uh, guidelines. And in the French rules, um, they have assigned the import VAT liability for imported goods from third-party countries to marketplaces. So if you are a marketplace and you facilitate sales uh, from third countries to customers and consumers in France, the marketplace is liable for the import VAT. And this can be quite challenging for, uh, for marketplaces or if you're in that role. Um, because in order to calculate the import VAT, the marketplace will also need to know how much import duties are due. And in order to calculate those import duties, you do not only need the value of the goods that, that are imported, you also need to know the origin of the goods. So where are they actually produced? So it's not by definition the country where they're sent from, but it's where they are produced. And you also need the commodity code in order to be able to classify uh, those goods. So in order to collect all this data, um, as a marketplace, you would need quite some uh, additional information. Over to an, an, another interesting highlight of what's happening in, in, in VAT, and that's in, in the African territory, it's in, it's in Nigeria. Um, Nigeria is actually a federation of 36 different states. And currently in Nigeria, there is a debate going on whether the federal government is allowed to collect VAT, whether the uh, federation contract has assigned that um, uh, option to the to the central government or whether that's part of the autonomy of the um, individual states and an interesting fact is that this um, debate was actually started by rivers state which is one of the um, southern states near the coast and what's what's quite essential in this discussion is it's the commercial center of the Nigerian oil industry. And as such, within Nigeria, it's quite a rich state. And the federal court has looked at the, 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 the federation uh, agreement and has resolved the issue and the discussion in favor of river state. So the result would be that VAT is collected by the individual states and no longer by the federation. And as a consequence also, the revenues can no longer be distributed amongst the states by the central government. And of course you can understand that the federal government was not too happy with this decision. So they're now seeking ways to acquire the necessary powers to indeed 
be allowed to collect the VAT and to create legislation around uh, VAT. And it should be no surprise that the poorer states in the north of Nigeria are backing this effort. And interesting is this that, for example, one of the ways how they can um, constitute this, this, this VAT and, and be allowed to collect it is by changing um, the constitution, so the state's the constitution. And this can be amended by the National Assembly, but each amendment must be ratified by two-thirds of the 36 states of the federation. So now they are basically trying to seek the balance between the poorer states of the north um, and, and the richer states of the south. So it's quite, um, quite an interesting uh, development. Another development, and this is not specifically for VAT, but it's, it's a wider um, amnesty law in Turkey. And Turkey has officially approved a tax amnesty law. And the purpose of this is to increase the tax revenues, the overall tax revenues, without an additional collection burden. So what they say is that um, taxpayers um, have the, the option to increase their tax base, for example, for corporate income tax, but also for personal income tax, and also for value added tax um, for the years 2016 to 2020. And if you increase your tax base, you do kind of a voluntary additional tax payment to the, to the Turkish authorities and then you're protected against tax audits for that specific tax in, in the years that you decided, well, okay, we are going to pay something extra. And for, for VAT, um, taxpayers may choose to pay an additional um, 3, 2.5 and 2% for these tax years. And of course, the percentage differs a bit per um, uh, per. per Per, per year. And the additional tax is actually calculated on top of the tax that was already reported. And without diving in, into all the details, my, my view is that the funny thing is that here, if you've underpaid or underreported significant amounts of revenue, this amnesty implies you also pay a penalty on top of this underreported tax. And to me, that sounds a bit, uh, sounds a bit strange. Um, but if you're off the hook for future audits for taxpayers, this can be quite, uh, quite interesting because it also implies that the extra VAT or the other tax that is charged and that you, that you report additionally also covers um, the interest and penalties that would have resulted from a tax audit. So from a taxpayer perspective, this can be quite, quite interesting. And maybe for the tax administration as well, because they do not have to perform these audits, go through the str struggles and court cases um, to collect this extra um, uh, amounts in tax. Let's now quickly jump to, to the UK. They have recently published um, statistics on their tax gap and how that tax gap um, has been constructed according to, to them. And in the last year, so that's, that's 2020, the overall tax gap was 35 billion um, British pounds. And that represents a little above exactly 5.3% of all taxes that should have been collected. And compared to the previous year, this was an increase of 2 billion um, British pounds. And um, around 35% 
of this total amount relates to uncollected VAT. In the past years, according to these statistics, the tax cap percentage went down, but now there is a slight upturn. And um, that, that, that could be because of all kinds of, of, of COVID issues, um, less revenue, because I'm not only referring to, to the, the, the VAT receipts, but the overall uh, tax receipts, because the VAT receipts are a bit, it gives a bit of a blurred picture because um, the UK uh, allowed for a delay of VAT payments during uh, this COVID period. So, of course, then the VAT revenue is a little bit lower, but that was still a possible claim um, that the tax administration has on taxpayers. Um, an interesting detail in, in this all is that 43% um, of the gap is attributed to small businesses, which to me reflects how difficult it is for SMEs to comply with complex legislation, but it's also difficult for them to set aside the taxes that are due as a result of their revenues and their profits. So it's apparently tempting to use those collected taxes in the course of your business. And then if um, you have to pay your taxes, then some of the SMEs run into trouble paying those, uh, paying those taxes. And this is supported by another statistic from, um, from HMRC that says that 19% of the overall tax gap is actually the result of failure to take reasonable care. So it's basically, like I said, spending part of that, that money that is, is due to the tax administration for, for business purposes. So that has basically that has nothing to do with fraud or evasion or, or tax planning. It's just, yeah, um, neglecting reasonable care. Tax evasion, which is illegal, um, accounted for um, 5.5 billion British pounds in tax, while tax avoidance, which is not illegal, um, but it's just, yeah, interpreting the, the, the tax legislation um, uh, very sharp, um, accounted for only 1.5 billion of lost uh, tax revenue. And then the final topic I would like to discuss um, is, is quite, quite it's, I, and I put it in this slides because I, I, I thought this is quite um, a curious one, and I wasn't aware, and that's that um, in Bangladesh, around 30% of the overall VAT collected comes from the sale of cigarettes. So from the sale of cigarettes um, and tobacco products only. And on the one hand, this is caused by the fact that 43% of um, the adults in Bangladesh consume tobacco products, and that's primarily caused by the fact that cigarettes in Bangladesh are extremely cheap. So there is quite a consumption of cigarettes, but this is not the only explanation, um, because the, the, the high percentage that cigarettes represent in VAT collection also has to do with the fact that in other sectors, um, there's actually limited collection of, uh, of VAT. So as a result, cigarettes are, are a large component. And that has to do with multiple exemptions in, the, in those other sectors. And there are all kinds of initiatives in Bangladesh now to reduce the use of tobacco products and to also reduce the, the percentage of VAT um, collected from these um, uh, from this consumption. The second topic on the agenda is um, Brexit, and I would like to provide you with um, a post-Brexit, um, yeah, 
update actually. And just first, for those who, who, who do not have that on top of mind anymore, um, first a brief reminder on what it actually is. The UK formally left the EU on the 31st of January 2020. And that was a tr transitional regime. So the UK remained inside the EU VAT regime until 31st of December 2020. So the 1st of January 2021 was the first day that the UK was independent from the tax regime in the EU. The consequence of this was, and also still is, that transactions between the EU and the UK qualify as exports and imports. So it's no longer intra-EU it's regular exports and imports the same as if you have a transaction with um, between a us established um, entity and, and an eu established entity so that's exactly the same <coughs> sorry for this um, this also implies that a lot of additional formalities like for example customs formalities have been introduced um, which was quite uh, a novelty for, for many businesses. And in addition, they have implemented, I would say, quite a draconian arrangement with Northern Ireland. And there are still discussions going on about, uh, about this. But Northern Ireland formally is part of, uh, of um, Great Britain, the UK. But it's, of course, closely connected to the rest of Ireland. And uh, for Northern Ireland, because of this connection with, with, let's say, Ireland as a country, it has been decided that Northern Ireland, as part of the UK, can still trade within the EU as if it's an EU member state. And there's been a, a specific um, VAT identification number has been created for businesses having operations in Northern Ireland. And if you look at the trade impact on, um, of, of, of the Brexit, um, it was quite visible that there was a significant drop in trade between the UK and the EU immediately after the 1st of January 2021. And this is reflected by the black line in these, um, in these graphs. But there was also quite an impact um, still with trade with the rest of the world. Um, and that also had to do with uh, trade agreements, for example, still being negotiated, but also a lot of uncertainty. There was a lot of unclarity um, for all businesses and traders, um, but also for couriers that all of a sudden had to deal with all kinds of new formalities. So this resulted in long queues of lorries at the borders, a lot of stress, no sufficient um, uh, customs employees to, to deal with everything, uh, um, uh, not enough customs agents to support, uh, to support the businesses and especially for, for businesses, UK and EU businesses, that were not used to export transactions. This also re resulted in many export documents that were incomplete, not filled in correctly. Um, yeah, and, and if you do not fill those um, documents properly, um, yeah, your, your, your logistics chain basically gets obstructed. And as a result, many fresh products and even like live animals like shellfish have been destroyed because of just these formalities. Um, and also the EU-UK trade agreement, it was still being negotiated at that, at that time around uh, 1st of January. So this did not help and contributed to the unclarity, but also to the uncertainty. And if you look at 
the the the, the graph about the post Brexit. So that's the, the red one. Um, and, and look at June 2021. Basically, trade has picked up um, quite well, and especially uh, the, the, the exports from the UK to the EU, they're above, um, let's say, the pre-Brexit um, uh, arrangements. But also after um, this pickup, and after the, the, the trade agreement has been negotiated, there are still side effects that, that every now and then uh, pop up. One of them is that um, because of COVID-19, um, France decided to shut down the channel tunnel for 48 hours. And this had quite an impact because as a result, there were around 7,000 lorries were stuck in the UK, could not leave the UK because the channel was closed. Also, e-commerce was quite significantly affected already by the 1st of January, because then the UK introduced uh, new rules. Um, for e-commerce, the, the UK introduced VAT reporting obligations on merchants selling to consumers in the UK. As UK VAT became due on those transactions. So all non-UK merchants were actually asked to register for VAT and report UK VAT. And this has stopped um, quite a few merchants from supplying to, to the UK. Added to this, because of Brexit, were the new customs formalities for both exports and imports. And one for me striking example was um, with, for example, Brooks Saddles, which was um, which is a UK traditional UK business, and they had to suspend their remote sales to UK customers because Brooks Saddles used a European central warehouse in Italy for its European distributions. So the saddles were produced in the UK, they were shipped to Italy for distribution purposes, and then if a customer wanted to order one from the UK, that sales was temporarily stopped by, by um, Brooks saddles because of all the uncertainties and, and, and the hindrance that they had for, from all the formalities. And also consumers were also facing quite significant additional costs because of VAT and customs handling. And that was also um, increased when the EU introduced also the new um, uh, e-commerce rules. The result of this is that customers and consumers rejected products that they had ordered because all of a sudden they had to pay additional fees to logistics companies, they had to pay import VAT, they had to pay import duties. Um, so they rejected the goods, but sending them back to the UK was actually too expensive. So a lot of these products have been stored and destroyed within the EU. And longer shipping times and extra VAT costs have discouraged customers from cross-border online shopping. And also payments between the UK and the EU became a bit burdensome um, and also more expensive because, for example, vendors like, like Visa and, and, and MasterCard, just to mention uh, two examples, they said, well, okay, we are required or we need to leverage, lever higher fees. And in order to overcome many of these challenges, and remain competitive and, and keep the EU um, uh, consumer customer base, there were quite a few UK merchants that have decided to actually create a presence in the EU to ensure a convenient customer experience and, and overcome all these troubles. So my question to you is actually um, whether your company has also um, been affected by, uh, by Brexit. 
And this could, for example, result in higher costs of tax duties and compliance, supply chain challenges, um, a decrease in cross-border sales, maybe an increase in procurement costs, um, and maybe you don't know or, or you, do, you don't have dealings in this area and you're not affected. So I'm very curious to understand um, yeah, how, how your how, or your business was, was impacted by, um, by Brexit, if any. Let me see where we are with results. I think we're pretty good. So I suggest let's wait for the final final calls. Yeah. There's yeah, if you look at the results, it's it doesn't surprise me. And many of you say, well, okay, we 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 are not affected or we're we're not aware of this. Um Interesting is to see that um, a, a little over 10%, around 12% did face supply chain challenges and a comparable percentage um, had issues with tax duties and, and compliance, which does not um, surprise me at all. <coughs> Sorry. The fact that um, there was a decrease in, in cross-border sales, yeah, that that's... Of course, that that's disappointing. It, it it is to be expected, but it's disappointing. So um, um, I, I wish that was not that would not have occurred. And of course, it's 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 the same also for an increase in in procurement costs. Um, yeah, you would hope that this would be kind of a seamless process, but many knew that that would not would would not happen. Let's quickly move to, to e-compliance and, and e-invoicing and, and tax collection. Um, yesterday we had a separate session about, uh, about e-invoicing, so I will only provide um, uh, a couple of highlights because there we also discussed the rise of, of mandates, the exponential rise of mandates globally. So if you're interested in that, please have a look at, um, uh, at that session. But I would like to highlight a few um, examples. Um, the first is Paraguay, that is now in LATAM also introducing e-invoicing. And a pilot will start the 1st of January. And already rather quick, there will also be a voluntary participation phase starting the 1st of April next year. Um, if you have a pilot and you have a voluntary phase, you would also expect to have a mandatory phase, but I have not seen any publications yet on when they would effectively require um, um, e-invoicing as, as a mandatory um, process. But it's not only in, in LATAM that uh, e-invoicing is high on the agenda, there's also in the rest of the world and also in the EU, there's, there's a lot happening, um, but also globally. And I'm not referring to business to, con to government invoicing, because this is mandatory in, in most of the EU countries already, um, but more the business to business and incidentally even uh, business to consumer. And when I had to add in the slides, I, I created this map um, that should reflect the current status of, of implemented mandates, which, which are the red countries, the announced one, which are France and Poland, they are amber, and the proposed or pink countries. But I have to admit, developments go quick, so this map is already uh, a bit outdated. Um, Slovakia has proposed um, a clearance model and the slide said that they will propose it, but in the meanwhile, they have already announced it, that they will introduce an e-invoicing system in 2022. And for those who don't know, the clearance model is a model where invoices are issued through a government portal, and then they immediately have um, your sales data, but all the, so the recipient's um, uh, purchase uh, invoice. Bulgaria is still in the preparation phase, so there's no 
real update yet, and I have not yet seen um, a, a decision. It's expected for the end of this year. Um, in addition to this, Romania um, has started their digital invoicing system for business to government, and that will be extended to business to business by the end of this year, according to their uh, to their planning. And the purpose is, of course, to help uh, reduce tax evasion. Poland will be implementing uh, their national system of e-invoices by the 1st of January 2022. Um, and that will also include a structured invoice according to their uh, standard template. Italy is expanding their um, uh, coverage of e-invoices. It was limited to uh, transactions within Italy. Um, they are now including San Marino as well, but they're also um, planning as of the 1st of January 2022 to include cross-border transactions with, with, with other countries. So this reflects that even if a country has um, rolled out a, an e-invoicing mandate, then still it's quite, it should be expected that it's subject to, uh, to change. And also Saudi Arabia, um, they have um, introduced e-invoicing and they also have already provided an update and, and further guidance on their, on their system. France has delayed their um, uh, e-invoicing introduction and it will become um, mandatory now as of the 1st of July 2024. And if you look um, to, to other countries, what's coming in 2022, um, we should have a look at Australia, New Zealand. They are planning to do um, uh, e-invoicing. Bolivia, Colombia in, in Latin, they are, are looking at invoicing. Um, Italy, like I said, they're expanding the mandate. Japan is looking at invoicing. They've become a papal authority and they are now also looking at, at digital invoicing, mandatory. Um, Paraguay, I already mentioned, but also the Philippines, Serbia and Vietnam are, are planning to introduce um, uh, e-invoicing. And I'm, I'm curious to understand how your business is, is preparing for this, for this global trend, this exponential trend of e-invoicing. Um, um, can you still say, okay, we are not preparing because, for example, you do not have to do because you're not in those territories? Um, have you selected um, a global solution uh, or did you deploy, uh, let's say, regional solutions? dependent on, on, on the territories or have you selected a few regional solutions and um, solutions per, for example, per country, which is also um, uh, an option. And um, So let's have a look at, um, at, at the results. I will still allow for, for a couple of seconds to, to, to put in your, um, your replies. But let's have a, have a look right now. A small majority says, well, okay, we're not, we're not preparing. Um, and, and yeah, if you're, if you're US based doing your business in the US, that's it, it, it's still not, um, not, not, not a requirement. Um, a little under 10% have selected a global solution from conversations with, with, with let's say, um, tax managers in business. I have already learned that selecting a global solution can be quite, quite a challenge. Um, and that's also why, why you see higher percentages in the regional solutions. And yeah, unfortunately, and I consider that really a pity, that it's still too often required that you select a solution per country. 
um, yeah, which which in my view it's not it's not effective, it's not efficient. <coughs> it's 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 additional um, uh, costs, um, but it has to do with with all the different mandates uh, for which you sometimes indeed need um, different different solutions. Let's have a quick look at at what's happening um, around the globe um, with respect to, to e-commerce. Um, in, in Europe, um, we had, had quite a significant um, uh, change by the 1st of July 2021. We changed to a system where sales to private individuals are taxable in the country where those private individuals are. Um, and we made a split between intra-EU sales and, um, let's say, the, the, the import sales. And um, what also happened is that uh, in order to ensure um, a level playing field with, for example, imports from, from China of low-value goods, they typically were um, not taxable for VAT in, in, in Europe because there was a low consignment uh, relief for, for goods with a value below 22 euros. And local businesses had to charge VAT if they sold something that, that had a low value. <coughs> so that, that low value exemption was, um, was, was abolished. They did something similar in the, in the UK. Um, one important um, additional development was that marketplaces also have become the deemed sellers for imported sales of, of goods with a value below 150 euros. And also for EU sales, um, made by non-residents, but that were facilitated by, uh, by the marketplace. The import one-stop shop for reporting import consignments with a value below 150 euros was a new reporting um, requirement. And there were some issues with, 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 this, uh, with this new system. There were some scenarios where double taxation occurred, where businesses had to pay their import one-stop shop VAT in the country of destination, but then also still the customs authorities required them to, to pay import VAT. Um, there was another issue with software compatibility because countries all implemented their own uh, software and that all has to link together because the import one-stop shop and also the, 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 the one-stop shop fat return, that's a European concept. So all the software needs to be linked together. So there were a couple of errors and issues with respect to, to filing and exchange of information um, between countries. But overall, um, reports are, say that the, the import one-stop shop um, has proven to be beneficial for um, uh, remote sellers importing into the EU. I just want to highlight a couple of, of, of let's say, e-commerce tax snapshots uh, around, around the world. And the first one is that um, New York has proposed legislation that will improve Pose an annual gross revenue tax for big tech uh, businesses. And that those businesses um, are said to profit from either collecting data from New York uh, residents, um, or it's a digital um, uh, advertisement for taxpayers. So New York wants to, to um, collect tax on these. And this is actually um, in line with what you see globally, where countries say, well, okay, we are actually going to levy a digital service tax, which is also currently still um, heavily under discussion.
The second snapshot I would like to share is that um, also Saudi Arabia not too long ago introduced the FAT system, but they're also providing now additional details on how you should tax um, online businesses. And the first line in this, in this snapshot um, targets companies like, for example, Booking.com and Airbnb. So they um, yeah, basically facilitate um, uh, res providing residence, um, for example, within, within um, uh, Saudi Arabia. The second line in this, in this slide um, targets companies like, for example, Uber, who provides uh, transportation services. The third line that says that VAT is not deductible for courier companies, um, that's to ensure that import VAT is actually a burden for customers and consumers that actually order something. And that burden should not be neutralized by courier companies deducting that import VAT that is actually not, um, that should not be their burden, but it's the burden of the consumers. And um, the fourth line says, well, okay, VAT is not refundable for returned goods. That's a painful one. But from a VAT perspective, it's not unlogical because import VAT is paid by the consumer upon importation. And if the goods are afterwards returned, they are exported by a consumer. And that's not a type of transaction that's typically entitled to a refund of a credit in, in a VAT system. The third snapshot that I would like to um, discuss with you is, and, and this is just an example from, from the Philippines about social influencers. They are now also targeted by, by tax administrations. And basically what they say is that these influencers, they generate income through social media, through media sites, through platforms, um, in exchange for, for services that they, they provide, like for example, advertising products. Um, and there are now tax administrations that say, well, okay, but actually those influencers, they are taxable persons, not only for, for VAT, but also for income tax. So they should report it and they should, um, uh, yeah, pay those taxes to the tax administrations. And also, for example, royalty incomes that, that they receive from um, sites like YouTube, um, yeah, they are also to be included in, in this, this concept, this taxable revenue concept. Um, what I'm curious to see is how this will work out for um, miners that are also influencers. You every now and then see um, miners being quite active as influencers. And is this income and, and tax liability then uh, contributed to their parents or is this parked or will they become the taxable persons? I don't know. So I'm curious to see, well, okay, what will happen over there? Another tax snapshot that I would like to, to discuss with you is, is cryptos. Despite China uh, banning cryptos, they remain quite popular. And also Elon Musk uh, has Twittered a bit around this. And his comment was that Tesla would accept um, crypto payments when mining becomes more energy efficient. In Kazakhstan, where they have about 17 official mining farms, they will introduce a digital mining fee by the 1st of January, 2022, based on the amount of electricity consumed by this mining activity. So that's a new tax that's been introduced. And the interesting detail here, at least for me, is that um, trading cryptos in Kazakhstan as such is not legal. Um, I already mentioned um, Saudi Arabia extending their 
um, let's say, online business taxation. And also Canada is extending, um, let's say, their, their GST, HST, to specific non-resident digital economy businesses. Um, and that's in essence, it reflects and, and affects e-commerce vendors of goods and services. It affects marketplaces. And also, for example, Airbnbers, they become liable for <coughs> for taxes in, um, uh, in, in, in Canada. And it was reported that the Canadian authorities will take a practical approach and they will have a kind of a discretion period um, for around 12 months for businesses to be able to comply with this new um, legislation. And finally, at the other side of the globe, um, looking at Cambodia, and this is to reflect that this is really a global uh, development, um, they have also introduced new rules and legislation and procedures governing value-added tax on goods and services also provided by um, non-residents. And most of these, these rules and developments, they are quite in line with what you see as a generic trend. But contrary here to, to for example, Canada, um, Cambodia has said, well, okay, we do not have kind of a um, discretionary period. The obligations start as the 1st of December, and if you're not compliant, um, you will face penalties. And in addition to this, um, also, for example, Belgium, they have introduced um, uh, additional taxation for, for Airbnb uh, providers. They can benefit, currently they can benefit from an exemption because in, their, in general they're small um, businesses. But this exemption has been um, abandoned and also Airbnbers will become uh, taxable in, in Belgium. The final topic that I would like to discuss is um, uh, some developments about uh, environmental taxes. Uh, the EU, as, as many of you will know, has, has announced a carbon border adjustment tax that will be levied on, at least at first instance, on energy intensive products. And within the EU, um, Bulgaria and Greece are most likely to see an impact on their imports because they import a lot of these CBAM uh, products. But overall, it's still it's a small percentage of their overall uh, GDP. Um, the go live, the entry into force of this of these regulations will be January 2026, and there will be a three-year transition period um, prior to uh, prior to this. And there's still quite some discussions. There's international pressure from China, from Russia on whether this would be um, an issue and whether it's really introduced. And some say that the EU is actually using this as a lever um, to enforce carbon pricing um, internationally, um, rather than being having a big appetite to implement this um, standalone. And quite recently, on the 25th of October, also the United Nations have released um, a handbook on, on um, uh, environmental taxes, including carbon border adjustment taxes, specifically also looking at, at developing countries um, and how to implement a carbon tax system and a way to price uh, emissions. Oh, I'm too fast. Yeah. Another trend in, in the EU is that there will be an introduction of, of, of energy taxation, um, basically to in, or in line with the Green Deal that the EU has launched. Um, the they will remove outdated 
um, exemptions, reduced rates will be uh, removed. And um, basically what they say is that um, environmental impactful usage of, of let's say fossil fuels um, that, that should simply be taxed. So exemptions for home heating, um, for, for transport, for air transport, for sea transport, um, for fishing, all those exemptions will be, uh, will be abolished. So they will, um, um, yeah, they, they, they will be taxed according to the, the, the energy taxation uh, directive, uh, basically. Um, one other development that, that's relevant and in line, it's not energy taxation, but the UK has um, announced that by April 2022, they will introduce a plastic taxation. Um, and that will affect plastic packaging manufactured in or imported into the UK that do not, does not contain at least 30% recycled plastics. So all relatively new plastics that, that, that will be introduced um, yeah, will face this new taxation in the UK. And what I would like to know is if you see um, a benefit in harmonization of green taxes globally and if so, who, in your view, should take the lead in this? Um, so do you see no benefit at all? Um, you could also say, well, okay, I see, do see the benefit, but I don't see harmonization happening. Um, you could say, well, okay, the international organizations like the OECD and the United Nations should take the lead or harmonization should be led by the large trading blocks like the UK, the EU, um, and, and China. Uh, let me have a look. There's still a few votes coming in. <coughs> so let's look at the, at, at the results. Now there's a, a, a fast, um, there's a majority of people who say, well, okay, I see a benefit, but don't see harmonization happening. Um, yeah, this, this is, I, I would probably also be in this, in this category myself, um, given the experience and with, with harmonization of, of taxes. Um, Quite a, quite a lot say, well, okay, it should actually be led by, by the large trading blocks. So that would then, in my view, imply that the US, Europe, um, and, and, and China should more or less be, be aligned on this. And um, a smaller group says, well, okay, it should be led by international organizations and, and, and the UN. And they could, of course, set, set the framework for this. Yeah, we've come at the end of the of, of the presentation. Um, um, what what you've seen probably is VAT has become increasingly important. Uh, there's huge stress on on real time reporting and that that e invoicing and, and and digital reporting really takes on globally, um, and especially in the EU, but also in in non EU countries, you will see that. There's quite an emphasis on well, okay, what's happening in the digital economy in green taxes. So my view, this should be or, or is expected to be uh, the new policy priorities um, popping up. 